Initiation by Robert Hugh Benson Part 2 Chapter 6 Part 2 Subsection 3 The rain had stopped, and it was after four o'clock, for she looked at her wristwatch as they left Roehampton Lane, when they approached the steep bridge that passes over the railway line immediately above Barn Station. Neville drove superbly. There had been no more philanthropic lessons bestowed gratis upon the passers-by. Everyone had behaved well, and the car best of all. He had settled down long ago into that instinctive, rhythmical mood of the driver who knows his car and his own powers, who acts from that trained subconscious attention which must be formed into a habit before a man is perfectly competent. As they swung up the steep ascent of the bridge, so steep that a pedestrian coming up the other side is bound to be invisible to the driver of a low car until the two almost meet, Neville became aware of a toppling motor omnibus in front, just beyond the crown of the bridge, going the same way as himself. He turned the wheel a little to the right, so as to be able to pass it if the road should prove to be empty when he had topped the rise. Exactly as he swept up to it, a perambulator, pushed by a small girl with a baby in it, became suddenly visible just over the top. Neville had the car entirely under control, but he had very nearly the full power on to take him up the steep, and his hand, fortunately, was already in place to shut it off. He did so automatically and put down the brakes. All would have been perfectly right if the girl with the perambulator had remained where she was or crossed over. He would have kept his line slightly to the left and behind the omnibus in one case, or held straight on in the other. Nothing could have happened. But she did precisely the one thing that made some kind of an accident inevitable. She pushed the perambulator in a panic behind the omnibus. She let go of the handles, and she herself remained where she was. Neville had one fraction of a second to decide what he would do. If he kept to the left, he would strike the perambulator. If he kept to the right, he would probably, but not certainly, strike the girl. He kept to the right. There was simply not time for the brakes entirely to check the car. And with a horrible tightening of his heart, he saw that, although the girl sprang away with a scream, she was still in front of the car. Then she fell. Whether actually struck or not by the off-wheel of the motor, he was unable to be sure. The car stopped. There fell on Neville, for one second, a complete paralysis. He knew that he had done the only possible thing, that he was within the speed limit, that the car was under control that he had not been guilty of even the slightest rashness. But it was his first accident, and there lay the child, screaming. Then Paul was out and running past. Then, as he turned without a word to Enid, she too flung off the rugs herself without a word and sprang out. Neville backed his car a little, turned, slid by the derelict perambulator, and came to rest clear of the bridge. Then, still sickened at heart, yet knowing that at least there could be no question of loss of life, and scarcely even of injury, he too climbed out of his seat and walked back. There seemed singularly few people about, owing probably to the recent rain. The omnibus had gone on its way, though he had seen figures on the top of it turn and look back. A couple of women, at a distance, turned and stared, horrified. A boy ran up, excited and pleased. A man on the common below seemed to be gazing up with interest. And that was all, except for the little group on the crown of the bridge. As he came up to them, he saw that the girl was already lifted to her feet and had ceased screaming. Paul was hurriedly brushing her down as well as he could. Enid was holding her round the shoulders. The girl's face was a mask of gradually fading terror and resentment but it was perfectly plain that she could not be really hurt. When he looked at Enid's face, as if to seek for reassurance, he was astonished at the vivid agony in it. She was as white as paper, and her eyes were large and anguished. 
She's not hurt, is she? He asked as naturally as he could. Enid made no answer. She was still staring at the girl, gripping her tightly. Come, said Neville, almost sharply. Let's see the damage. Did it hit you, my dear? The child made no answer. Perambulator, Paul, said Neville, jerking his head in its direction. Wheel it behind the car. Come along, my dear, to the car, and let's see what's the matter. It was becoming plainer every moment that no harm was done at all. The girl was standing quite at her ease, embarrassed far more by Enid's embrace than by anything else. Of course, it had been a shock to everybody, most of all, perhaps, to the child. However, there was no reason why there should be a scene. Besides, they were all in the narrow of the bridge. Enid, said Neville, still a little abrupt, of course, just bring her along to the car. He put his hand on the child's shoulder. Leave her, leave her, gasped Enid. Don't be upset, said Neville. There's no harm done at all. Don't give way, my darling. Again, he put his hand on the child's shoulder. She was still speechless. Leave her, gasped Enid once more. Neville turned in despair and, to his relief, saw a policeman advancing up the road. Thank God, murmured Neville. He shortly explained the circumstances. That was his car. That was his chauffeur. His own name was Sir Neville Fanning. There had very nearly been an accident. The child had fallen down. The policeman was quite sensible and civil. He nodded once or twice. Then he turned to the child. Are you hurt, my dear? The child shook her head dolefully. The blue uniform seemed to have restored some degree of intelligence to her mind. Come along to the gentleman's car, he said. Let go, Enid, said Neville. Enid turned wild eyes upon him. Neville went up to unloose her hands. It seemed to him that Enid was really not quite herself. Come, he said. We'll soon see what's the matter. Enid let go unwillingly, but her face was drawn and set. She said nothing. There was nothing whatever the matter with the girl. She had just been touched by the wheel on the knees, but her stockings were not even torn. The policeman elicited from her where she lived, not half a mile away. I'll take her along home, said Neville. Enid, my dear, you jump inside with her and the baby. Paul and I will sit in front. The policeman said he would take the perambulator home. Neville grinned secretly at the vision which his imagination presented of this. Very good, he said. We'll wait till you come. You've got my number, no doubt. There'll be no difficulty, sir, said the policeman. No harm done. When Neville turned again to see that all three were established inside, he saw that they had grouped themselves oddly. The child nurse, rather pallid now, held the baby, and Enid, on her knees on the floor of the car, supported the girl's feet on her lap. My dear, what are you doing? There's no kind of necessity for that. Enid shook her head fiercely. Neville had a spasm of impatience. My darling, don't be ridiculous. She isn't hurt in the slightest. So extraordinarily savage was the face turned on him that he recoiled. Yet a strange feeling came upon him that Enid was not quite genuine. He felt very odd and confused. He made to close the door, then he hesitated, then he closed it, leaving them. He could talk out anything that needed it afterwards. Subsection 4 My dear girl, whatever's the matter? said Neville, a quarter of an hour later. Everything had been perfectly satisfactory. They had found the girl's mother at home, a sensible woman who said that she had particularly told her daughter never to take the perambulator over the bridge, that no harm had been done at all, and that she hoped it would do the girl good. So, for the third time that day, Neville had been a philanthropist. He glanced at Enid to see if she was amused, but was met by a set face and unanswering eyes. The policeman had followed a few minutes later, 
with the perambulator before and a small procession of round-eyed boys behind. And there, too, everything had been satisfactory, even to the policeman. For Neville gave him half a crown privily. Yet all this while Enid had stood, stony-faced, refusing to sit down, and speaking only when the woman spoke to her in a very low voice. Then Neville had told Paul to drive, and himself got in after Enid into the closed car. She said nothing in answer to his question. He tried to take a hand, but she drew it away. Look here, my darling, have I done anything? Don't speak to me, she hissed. He drew back. You aren't treating me fairly, my darling. I seem to have offended you. Remember our bargain. Tell me what I've done and I'll beg your pardon. She turned and eyed him, and if ever he saw hostility in any face, it was in hers. For a moment, she did not speak. Then she suddenly began, and as she talked, a kind of sickness grew on the other. It was as if the girl was possessed. Very well, she said, I will tell you. It is the last straw. I have tried and tried, and it is useless. What have you done? Well, you have treated me brutally, but this is the last straw. That you should tell me publicly not to be ridiculous. That you should try to tear me away by force when I was trying to help a poor child whom you had knocked down. That you should make me a laughing stock, and before that woman too. But that's only the last of the list. You have treated me disgracefully. Shall I go through it all? Well, I will. Then indeed she began. She went right back to Hartley. It was there, it seemed, that he had begun to be careless and offensive. There was an occasion, it seemed, when he had made her stand while he sat. Of this he had neither then or at any other time the faintest recollection. Then it appeared he had spoken to her rudely about Father Richardson. He had told her not to be so familiar, and then later not to be so discourteous. Then he had allowed Masterson to be rude to her, and had laughed at her with Aunt Anna. Her whole stay at Hartley, it appeared, had been one series of insults received. Then she passed on to London. The insults, it seemed, had begun at the academy. He had allowed her to go on alone while he talked to her mother and her mother only. He had shown his dislike of Lord Maresfield, oh, in little movements and glances. He had not said anything outright, but she was not a fool. She could understand him well enough. After dinner that same night, he had kept her and her mother waiting while he smoked with his friend. Then the Selva affair came up. First, he had been brutal in the way he had flatly contradicted her as to Selva's capabilities. He had told her she didn't understand what genius was. He had preferred to lean over the box and stare at that horrible painted woman sooner than talk to her. Mr. Lennox, even, had had better manners. Then he had gone out after both acts in order to smoke again instead of doing his duty. She thought that he might at least have recognized his duty if nothing else. Then he had gone and arranged behind her back that she too and her mother, in spite of what he knew as to her feelings, should go and meet Selva, a woman who was unfit for decent society. He had dragged them there against their will. He had stayed talking to Selva, leaving herself and her mother alone. She had borne with these things and had said nothing at the time, hoping that it was mere carelessness. That was why she had not protested then and there. Then, when she had tried, very gently, to show him what he was doing, he had had the grace to pretend to apologize, but had, really, repeated his offense. Didn't you apologize? Can you deny that? He bowed his head. He said nothing. A horrible and grotesque memory came to his mind, of how a certain cock at Frascati had once turned savagely on his hens when he himself was unhappy. And now you won't even be civil enough to answer. Then she swept on. 
tiny incidents he had forgotten, during the last three days which he had thought so happy, were dragged out and flung at him. But they all culminated in today. He had mocked at her friend Lord Maresfield. He had said London was dreary, a desolate hole. That to her, while he sat with her. He had stood sulky at the window and said nothing, even though she had laid down what she was reading to talk to him. Then he had yawned in her face. Neville was too sick even to be tempted to smile. Then finally had come the motor drive. He had behaved like a road hog. He had torn past the helpless old man in the park. He had tried to get the better of a drayman. He had knocked down a child. And then... Then once more came the crowning insult. She had tried to make up by sympathy for what he had done, and he had tried to tear her hands away from the child. He had told her not to make an exhibition of herself publicly. He had laughed at her fears. He had tried to exchange glances with her in the very house of the poor woman whose child had been knocked down. It's the last straw. I can't bear it anymore. I've borne enough. Be good enough not to speak to me. Subsection 5 He sat through it in silence. There was nothing to say. With three or four exceptions, the substance of the tale was true enough for him to recognize it. There was scarcely more than a point or two in her torrent of charges that was objectively false. He sat silent, because after her first three or four sentences, he had seen the hopelessness. If she could say so much, she could say anything, and no answer was possible. But what held him toward the end, in something very like horror, was the shocking change in her whole character from that which he had previously believed it to be. It was as if a mask had been torn suddenly away, and a frightful face disclosed. He had thought her very nearly sublime, unlike others, spiritual, aloof, unique. He had thought her markedly self-controlled, of an exquisiteness transcendent of that which breeding can give, tolerant, charitable, even great. He had loved this presentiment that he had seen, loved it as he had never loved any living being before to his knowledge. He had thought that she understood him perfectly. He had hoped humbly and simply that he was learning to understand her. Yet now, in an instant, a terrifying kind of coarseness disclosed itself. She snarled at him, She framed, as well as she could, sentences and phrases with the object of giving as much pain as possible. She tortured things and words into sinister intentions that had never even crossed his mind. He was as one who goes to kiss his wife and is met by a devil's changeling. He had had no conception, not merely that one whom he loved could be so horribly transformed, but that human nature itself was capable of it. Towards the end, some kind of coherence came back to his mind, and, as if without volition on his part, the thread of fiery beads, of which he had caught just a glimpse as he walked in the park last Saturday, good God, four days before only, that thread began to run past again. He began to see that there had been that element in her all through, the fierce, rending, tearing tiger that loved to wound and mar that rejoiced in pain. There was the other side of her still, he did not even now wholly forget that, the serene, tender, comprehending girl whose heart leapt so swiftly to meet his. But that disguise of hers, if it were no more than that, was a floating phantom that moved from him as he looked, leaving him with this fiend that seemed at present the unveiled reality. He grew quieter yet, interiorly, as he saw these things. His whole physical self felt sick and exhausted, but yet the deadly peace increased as she severed, with her two-edged tongue, fibre after fibre that bound him to herself. It was a deadly peace. He knew that well enough. 
the peace of a seared and white-ashed countryside over which a devouring flame has gone. Subsection 6 She did not end till they were sliding up past the Albert Memorial. Be good enough not to speak to me. Those were her last words. Be good enough not to speak to me. They were in Cadogan Lane by now. It was up at that further end, visible beyond Paul's head, that they had passed out so happily a couple of hours ago. They had turned up through the square, he remembered, and so on, towards the park. These were the houses which he had seen when he had walked up in the rain before lunch. He remembered looking at them and wondering vaguely who lived in them, as he had let down his umbrella. Yes, and this was the door of the flat where Paul was drawing up so skillfully. Up those stairs was the door of the flat. The car had stopped now. That was the porter he could see within the glass panels. Oh, he must get out now. He was nearest that side. And he must hold the door and help her out. The rain had stopped. There was no need to open an umbrella. Yes, he would just push back the glass door on this side while the porter held the other, that she might pass through. She was gone through now. Yes, he had better go home. Home, Paul.